This, this question is for um, Sean Gab and Daniel Modell. Um, Sean, you mentioned that Thatcher raising interest rates uh, caused a great deal of, uh, of uh, trouble with the labor class specifically. And uh, in my mind, raising interest rates was a way for her to strengthen the currency. Uh, where had that effect anyway? And uh, da Daniel Modell, you said that, um, that a strong currency is actually good. And so it, they're contrasting comments because you said it was damaging in, in England's case and, and good for Switzerland of a strong currency. I, I think w the sudden appreciation of the Swiss franc was, was problematic. Um, and my question to both of you is, uh, is would this problem or lack of a problem uh, or the sudden change thing, how would that be affected if there were a w single worldwide currency unit, um, specifically gold, by weight. Um, well, I, I guess I should. Sorry, I, mean, I forgot one thing. Um, it, the Federal Reserve sometimes says something like, uh, "Wages are sticky downwards," and so that the trouble, the good thing about uh, uh, moderate inflation rate is that it gives kind of automatic wage cuts. And uh, so, in, 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 a, in a world with gold that steadily appreciates in value, it, it probably would happen that. A worker with steady productivity would have a steady wage cut over a period of years. Um, so well, anyway, how would you? And, and could you do that just with the, with a strong currency unit like the Swiss franc? Um, just just cut wages or cut cut? How would how would that work? The if I could begin, the, the, I, I agree that wages are sticky downwards, but that may be because the trade unions um, resist any kind of wage cut. But but it is also a fact that there are contracts of employment which specify wages and it, it is difficult to renegotiate those. I, I have no objection to a strong currency and that's putting it mildly, but there is a difference between a currency which is naturally strong I I in times of a, a neutral monetary policy and a strengthening of the currency in response to a sharp and sudden increase increase in, in interest rates. And the, the problem, the monetary problem we faced in 1979, so far as I can tell, is that the British government was running a large budget deficit, which was then monetized. And there are various ways of stopping that, but the most painless way of stopping it, if I can use the phrase in macroeconomic terms, was to cut government spending, to close the, um, to close the budget deficit the entire burden of adjustment would then have been imposed on the state sector for which the budget deficit existed anyway and there would have been no need to raise interest rates. What the government did was to raise interest rates in order to stop the creation of new money by the banks. The government continued to borrow money in vast quantities. It's just that um, private business was crowded out, and that was a serious mistake. Uh, there were other reasons why the currency would have strengthened in any event. There was the, um, th there was the beginning of the s res sale receipts from North Sea Oil, but the sudden, the, the dramatic rise in sterling was an unexpected shock. British industry was on the whole the weakest sector of the economy, of the private economy, and it, it took industry by surprise. And as I said, uh, about a quarter of it collapsed over, four, over three years. So, uh, some of this should have been in decline for years. It should have been replaced by more modern industries, but um, to bring this kind of shock on suddenly was a disaster for many people. Uh, well, your question is, is uh, directed in a field, in a field of complete mess, and in a way, it's uh, it's so hard to <laughs> to say anything in monetary policy because the disaster. I never thought, as a student at that time, that things would would be the way they are today. Never, I would never have thought that there is a one. Uh, one euro for different economies uh, and and obviously it happened and i don't know how it could happen 
we don't have natural interest rate. Uh, it's a complete mess, mess in the sense that we lose orientation as such. So what shall I answer? I just pick the positive sides of a complete mess, which in a way is, is uh, nothing to do with objectivity. the strengthening of the currency quite quick. So after that happened, uh, just 11 months after that, I, I went into negotiation for a transaction that was worth much more than 100 million. I mean, this is, a, in a way, a very quick act to take the positive side out of this complete chaos. And this is a typical opportunistic behavior of an entrepreneur. But if you ask me as an economist, uh, and probably as a philosopher, uh, Rahim would have to say a, a lot to, to this mess as well. We lose orientation. We are in a bubble economy. And uh, I, I presented you uh, a, a wonderful story of, of a success, but uh, what is bubble out of this success? I am lost in, in such a, uh, a question. And I couldn't tell you, of course, many are failing in, in that mess. So we have to keep being opportunistic. And the, the way out is the way in the middle. So we have too low interest rates. And Switzerland has a too strong currency, definitely, because the whole world is speculating in Swiss francs. And the national economy of Switzerland is a, a fraction of a world uh, economy. So this disparity is so large, you, <laughs> uh, you have to state this, and there is no way out unless in the middle. So we took on debts for this acquisition. The interest rates we pay is 0.8%. This is a ridiculous interest rate, but we take it. We are opportunistic, and we do not. We should not feel ashamed for it. Uh, but it's the wrong interest rate. But let's take it. We have a too strong currency, so let's use it for an acquisition. That's my very praxeological <laughs> answer for a mess. Sorry, I can't do more than that. Hi, I have a question for the first two lectures in the morning. Um, I am myself home educated, uh, first in China and in England. Um, sorry, oh, okay, that's my voice there, found it. <laughs> uh, so I was home schooled, first in England and then, uh, first in China and then in, in England, uh, when I would tell people in China that I'm homeschooled, first question they would ask me is, oh, what do you study at home? But when I told people in England, they would say, are you allowed? That, that was the natural reaction. I just found it fascinating. But uh, I did work with children myself um, for many years. I do find that, um, following the first lecture there, the end consumer of so-called education, as it were, I think is really the children, no, not the parents. The parents are there to guide us and, and so on and so forth, maybe all the way through university. But, but the, the children themselves are the consumers of, of learning uh, in a way. And I think that should be stressed uh, more in the whole process. And besides, the word for me, the word education for me is not even a nice word because, you know, growing up in communist China, if you didn't do it right the first time, they re-educate you somewhere in uh, Xinjiang or Inner Mongolia or so on and so forth. But, um, well, I, I don't think I have a question as such, but um, maybe your comments as to, I'm not a parent myself, um, but I understand many of you here are. Um, what would you think if, if my point of view is being the, the the parents being the, the guardians or uh, the, they pay for the education because the children can't pay for it, even though they're the consumers. Uh, how do we settle that, um, that issue there in, in search of better education or better quality 
uh, goods uh, here as such. Uh, well, of course, in the market sense, uh, it's those who pay, who, who are the consumers, and uh, there might be a misalignment of interest sometimes. And in higher education, I observe it a lot. There's not that the interests of the parents and the children are not entirely aligned, and that may also be abused by private entrepreneurs. I've seen that, uh, uh, and of course, it's it's a challenge to this whole question of who's the what's. Uh, uh, the responsibility of a custodian of a child. The typical political response was that, and that was something that was really claimed in the uh, early 19th century, in particular in the British debate. Uh, uh, it was Nassau Senior, even a classical liberal, who claimed that uh, the problem is parents who are not educated are not able to make the right choice for the children. So we only have to educate one generation, and after that we can leave it to the market. Of course, it was never left to the market because once you take away the responsibility of the parents, of course, how should they learn <laughs> to make the right decisions? So it has been perpetuating ever more and there is no sign that people, the parents are making better decisions now than they did in the 19th century, quite to the contrary in uh, some fields. So you can't really solve the problem polit politically uh, and usually parents making right decisions are a symptom of a culture that will remain wealthy and will sustain itself. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's a tautology <laughs> in the end, because if in a society parents always make the wrong decision, this society wouldn't really count uh, that much in the end and there wouldn't be much education left and no one left to pay for it. Um, so if a society survives and flourishes, you can assume that parents are making not so bad decisions, even if you don't understand them. Uh, because a lot of market demand, and we see it where the state is not intervening, like in third world countries, in some slums, there is some uh, market education there. And parents focus on the fo a foreign language and uh, very universal technologies like writing and computer science. And I think that's not so bad a choice. Uh, in the medieval era, it was Latin um, and uh, the trivium, I called it. And I think today, yeah, it's a foreign language, probably English, uh, and another one, if you can afford it, as a basic minimum standard and probably some uh, affinity for computer science programming uh, as a basic education. Everything else, I'd say, is a leisure, leisure activity, which you, as a... A uh, good custodian would enable your children if you have the wealth, if you can afford it. For many children, I think that working is a better choice than education. I mean, one of the worst things of the public education system is to force children at puberty uh, between at the age where they're incapable and uninterested in, in uh, explicit abstract learning, force them to sit in a closed room. Uh, whereas afterwards they'd be interested and before. So we focus most money on particularly the, the wrong age of children. And that's only no market entrepreneur could in the long run survive. It's only a system uh, which is not held responsible for its results that can waste most of the money at the time when children are less perceptive uh, for education. Um, yes, I mean, if I were going to think about the, the uh, tension between the, the child and the parent, um, if you look at a child who is um, uh, one month old, that child is very dependent on the parent for, for everything, and the parent makes decisions on behalf of the child, which are not really challenged by you know, anybody. Uh, then you go to 18, then it's sort of the opposite, because at 18 the child is actually uh, pretty self-sufficient, and they, they're capable of earning money if they really have to. So to the extent the parents spend money at that point, it's more like a charity kind of organization. And, um, and certainly the legal responsibility of the parent to the child pretty much ends up at 18. So the way I see the years in between you know, zero and 18 as a sort of linear interpolation between these two extremes of infinite dependency of the child to basically no dependency. And so anything that happens at, say, 13, at puberty, you know, is a bit of a negotiation between the two, but the weighting scheme should be driven by sort of some linear interpolation. Um, so in, uh, in sort of my 
family, uh, I, I don't actually really run this as a democracy. Uh, it's more like a monarchy. And uh, actually, with the property and freedom society in the first year was defined uh, by Professor Hopper as a uh, monarchy, I think, something like that. There was some word along those lines. Um, but the, the truth is, as a monarch, um, and I think it's uh, Juan Carlos uh, of Spain who said that, uh, it's something like, uh, I'm the king, but I'm only the king if I don't actually use my power as the king. The, the less you use the power as the king, the more you actually stay the king. So I think that it's quite important to sort of not uh, use the power so that you keep it. Hi, I wanted to first compliment all five of you on very, very excellent speeches. I really enjoyed them all. I, I sat here and listened to every word, uh, the ones that I could hear while I was still awake because I'm still time lagged, but the ones I heard were really good. Uh, I wanted to give my views on Margaret Thatcher and invite anyone to comment on them who was interested. I'm sure Sean, who spoke about her, would. Uh, I wanted to acquaint you with uh, Ludwig Lachmann, who was an Austrian economist from South Africa, and one of his favorite statements was, V must smash Zem. Uh, I, I admired his spirit greatly, and that's roughly my view on unions. The V must smash Zem, they are evil. Uh, not necessarily, because it's conceivable to think of a union that only engages in mass quits, which would be compatible with the libertarian non-aggression axiom. But uh, most unions that we know of, or virtually all unions that we know of, uh, initiate violence against people, and therefore they deserve to be smashed. Um, my view on Margaret Thatcher is she was magnificent in smashing the unions. Uh, as for a lot of people losing their jobs, I'm not that familiar with the British situation, but in the US, uh, Detroit was smashed because of the unionism. They were getting something like $75 an hour, uh, whereas in the South, the, the union members in the automobile industry are making like 15 or 20 an hour, which is you know decent, and, and you're not gonna go bankrupt if you have to pay that much. Murray Rothbard used to have this thing called, um, what was it, um, praxeological history, a priori history, you can't do a priori history. And he would say, just because the Soviet Union was very vicious internally doesn't mean that they were very vicious externally. And I think that uh, looking at foreign policy, the, the Russians or the Soviets were not that bad in foreign policy, they were very bad in domestic policy. And one of the things that I, despised Margaret Thatcher for was that she was very anti-Soviet Union. Uh, so there I would agree that she was very bad, but on the other hand, smashing the unions and privatizing what they called the council housing in the US would be called public housing, I thought was magnificent. So uh, I agree she had some good and some get bad points, but I think the good points were privatization and smashing the unions, and the bad points were she was a warmonger. And uh, warmongering is, uh, and I'm not talking about defensive warmongering, I'm talking about offensive, and she was very bad on that. So that would be my view on Margaret Thatcher, and please, if anyone wants to comment, uh, feel free. One of the secrets of, of course, one of the secrets um, in politics is to set priorities. And without prejudice to the um, statement that the unions were a menace in the 1980s, that they were not the greatest menace. They, they were not an existential threat to the constitution and the liberties of my country. That they were a nuisance which had to be dealt with they were a nuisance which was dealt with. But the real existential threat in the 1980s in both Britain and America was the growth of the politically correct classes. They are the people who brought on the police state. All the trade unions wanted was a bit of old fashioned socialism and free things which they couldn't have, and they didn't get it. But um, that is something that could be dealt with and was dealt with. 
the, Margaret Thatcher's greatest shortcoming was that she entirely failed to realize that the dispute in Britain, which had raged since the 1920s, was effectively over and that there was a new dispute about which she unfortunately did nothing, or perhaps less than nothing. Would you like to? Yeah, I, I would definitely agree that the best thing she did was she sold off the council houses. Um, because that's really in line with not only the left libertarian position on how to privatise and how not to privatise, but also um, it, in Democracy of the God That Failed, there's a chapter to a similar effect on de how to desocialise. Um, however, her privatisations were nowhere near as good as the selling off of the council homes. Um, when she sold off the, the social housing, she just created millions of property owners um, w w with the click of a finger. Uh, but with with the privatizations, um, she, she tended to just create private monopolies and she didn't deregulate sufficiently. The same with John Major's government. Um, but yeah, I, I think taking Margaret Thatcher's selling off of the council homes as a, a general policy for how, how to actually go about privatization is a good one, but she still only sold them at something like 30% lower than the market rate. I would have given them away. Um, same with government buildings and things like that. Uh, just very quickly to add something I actually remember of um, socialist communist China privatizing uh, council housing as it were. Um, basically how it worked as far as I remember uh, workers would work for a company state-owned uh, but labor itself is state owned, right? That's assumed. But you you would be given housing. There is housing allocation, and there is internal calculation on how much would allo would be allocated to housing repairs because buildings has to be still built, families grow, and people get married, and it's life is quite messy, and they actually have to calculate. But when uh, Deng Xiaoping came into power, and so on, I think maybe um, 10, 10 years later, uh, or so after that, so basically state-owned factories would be bankrupt. Their assets, if any left, would be sold off at discounted rates, but also people's homes, the, these workers, they, they've been living in their generations, they had to be privatized. So in a sense, they were almost given away for f not free because they actually paid for it through their wages. So, so they paid for it. You know, it was theirs. People considered their home theirs anyway, even though they didn't have a deed. Um, each person would be allocated their own. I don't know how it worked in England, but in a true socialist country, uh, as I consider China was, in an extreme, that's how, how it worked practically. Um, and people had um, no problem with that, I guess. Um, and I think Deng Xiaoping is well loved in China as well. <laughs> so. Very quickly, um, I much blame Margaret Thatcher for her legal and constitutional changes. There is no case to be made for the defense where that is concerned. The messing up of privatization is something that I should regard with a, a great deal more indulgence. There had never been a large-scale program of privatization of state assets before. The Thatcher government was making things up as it went along, and it made grave mistakes. But, as I said, this was a learning experience. Other countries appear to have done the job rather better than our government did. But um, the Thatcher government led the way in privatization. And I think we should look with some indulgence on the often very grave mistakes which were made during that process. Just out of false modesty, I think, um, out of modesty, rather, uh, Sean hasn't mentioned the fact that he was the economic advisor to Václav Klaus while he was Prime Minister. Um, I think that's probably worth mentioning. So, you know, it may be that you learn from Thatcher's mistakes during the privatisation, uh, but yeah, the, the Czechoslovak government tended to do privatisation much quicker and, and much better.
Uh, there were comments that Margaret Thatcher was a warmonger. I'm not saying she was or she wasn't. Uh, there was comments about Russia, and I would just like to say that it was Margaret Thatcher who reached out to Member of Parliament John Brown, asking him to go as her ambassador to meet with Gorbachev, saying, see what we can do and whether we can work with this man. Um, after John Brown met with Gorbachev, he came back and said, yes, we can work with this man, and she met with him, and it was a, a big opening for the West, and of course he then went to America, and so that comment is just... She, she did reach out in a, in a big way. And I'd also like to say that it's because of Margaret Thatcher that countries around the world considered having women in more powerful positions. Women, half the human beings on the planet, were definitely given a trailblazer to look up to. And so I think that this is a very important part of her legacy. Hi, um, Pastor Olivia or Rahim, but anybody's welcome. Um, we're seeing in Europe large disparities in youth unemployment. To what extent do you believe that's a consequence of educational policies in the, in the different countries and or the different regulatory policies? Um, I'd be happy to hear your opinions on that. It's working, okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, I think somebody said that you shouldn't stick the kids in school um, forever um, if there are 50 jobs, I think you said that, if there are 50 jobs uh, for graduates, you should have a million diplomas. And so uh, clearly uh, lots of people are being um, um, put into sociological studies or African-American studies or whatever, you know, whatever they're doing these days. And um, that's not really preparing them uh, with uh, skills that they can sell in the labor market. Now, when you couple that with um, a minimum wage law, right? Then you're, you're actually f spending a lot of money to uh, form people to give them productivity levels that are very low, and then you know obviously the wage uh, limit is here. So then clearly they're going to be unemployed. I think uh, if you scrapped the uh, minimum wage laws then you would see all these graduates from um, sociology studies get jobs that are very low paying. They wouldn't be unemployed. They wouldn't rage against the machine or the system or against the man. They, they would actually talk, take those jobs because they would have to. And then maybe there would be some percolation effect down the road whereby they would maybe either not go to university altogether or maybe specialize in computer science or something that is useful. Um, but, you know, given now that they, uh, they are unemployed, almost unemployable, and they probably get subsidized for being unemployed, there's probably some sort of, uh, you know, government uh, welfare scheme for them. <coughs> but that's really not very healthy kind of uh, loop. Yeah, I totally agree. It's a vicious combination of regulation and the educational system. Uh, the countries with the highest youth unemployment usually are those with uh, least vocational training and the most ac academization uh, of jobs. Uh, and uh, if you don't have the vocational training, at least it starts earlier and it's more on the job, it's more practical. If it's the whole thing academic, then you have very low productivity with uh, 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 people go coming from university to, to the enterprise because they ha practically have to be retrained. So their productivity is very low or even negative uh, in the beginning. That's why you have such a lot of unpaid, uh, um, how do you call it, the practice, internships uh, uh, and, and so on. So that is of course closely linked, uh, uh, but of course uh, at the same time it's in uh, countries which have the euro and their level of productivity doesn't match. Uh, that uh, it's the low productivity people that uh, suffer the most. Uh, and uh, interestingly, it's people coming, going from university to the job market. Still, they feel that they have a right uh, to higher salaries than they would get according to the uh, already low productivity. And that's even more of a mismatch. Uh, yeah, big cal calculation problem, I'd say. I don't think that taking courses in feminist studies or queer studies or 
black studies or sociology all about the same. I, don't, I think that reduces productivity, but I think that they could still get jobs without a minimum wage, you know, uh, hauling uh, trash or washing dishes or something like that. Um, with regard to Margaret Thatcher, I'm a big fan of hers in spite of the fact that she's a woman, not because of the fact that she's a woman. Uh, I don't think she was the first woman to be head of state. I think Golda Meir beat her by a bit, maybe Indira Gandhi. I'm not sure about that. But uh, the, reason, the, the reason why there are so few women leaders is because my understanding is that the average IQ of men and women is about the same, but the standard deviation or the variance of women is very, very low. The standard deviation of men is much higher. So you get men out two, three, four standard deviations above the mean and also below the mean. Uh, they're in jail, they're uh, homeless, whatever. Uh, that's why there are so few women in leadership positions. And this feminist stuff about, you know, Hillary should win because she's a woman. And, and the reason that there are so few women around is because men are sexist pigs or something like that. I think that's all wrong. I think it's because of the standard deviation or the variance of abilities that you get so few women who are grandmasters in chess or who are winning uh, Nobel Prizes or uh, Fields Prizes in mathematics. Now, they win in, in, in literature but God knows what the criteria there is. It's usually to, to give it to women uh, or poetry or something like that. I mean, you get uh, counterexamples every once in a while. You, you get uh, chemistry, uh, I think one woman won there. Um, uh, I forget her name. Uh, Marie Curie. Yeah. And then there was a woman in, in uh, economics, but that's only one uh, woman uh, uh, in economics or in uh, in chemistry. And I, I think th that this idea that little girls are taught that they should have half of all jobs is, is crazy. Uh, in, in my school, they want to have a uh, you know, uh, prof professoriate that looks like America, which means since blacks are 15% or 14% of the population, 14% should be uh, uh, professors. But the NBA or the NFL, the basketball or the football has got blacks of 70 or 80%. So maybe what we should do is fire them all because they should only have 13% of uh, the NFL, uh, even though they're obviously much better. And, and I think the NFL and the um, uh, NBA are roughly proportionate to ability. Uh, black people have springs in their legs. They can jump 40 feet high, and that's why they're there, not because of any uh, discrimination or anything like that. Thank you. Um, can I start an argument with Keir? Uh -huh. you've, you've said, Keir, that ja Sorry. you have said, Keir, that James II was an apostle of toleration. Now, I agree that he said in the 1680s that he wanted to throw open all state employments to all his subjects, regardless of their religious background, which is a most noble sentiment. However, it is one thing to say that as an ordinary individual, as a philosopher, shall we say. It's another thing to say that when you are the person who appoints people to those state positions. Can you tell me how many Protestants he appointed to important positions during his reign? As soon as he had established that he would be able to appoint Catholics to senior positions, he only appointed Catholics to senior positions, and indeed his own cousin, the Earl of Rochester was forced to give up his position in the administration because he refused to convert to Catholicism. Um, I, I could mention that when James went up to Scotland in 1679, he had no objection to persecuting the extreme dissenters at the time. Also, when the Huguenots turned up in England in large numbers in 1685, he had no objection to requiring these people to, um, to conform to the Anglican church before they could receive the charity that he established for them. Uh, and so James has form, not only as somebody who was biased in favor of his own faith, 
but as somebody who actually persecuted people from what he would have regarded from one gross heresy into another. I, I'm not entirely convinced by his credentials as a man of toleration. Uh, well, you ask how many, what do you mean by an important position? You mean to cabinet or to the, the Privy Council? Uh, Halifax was an Anglican. Uh, Rochester was at the beginning, still was, sacked him afterwards. Um, Clarendon. Was it Lord President of the Council? Hmm? Ah. Uh, okay, well, Clarendon. Um, William Penn. Uh, yes. Um, he, he was an advisor of some sort. Um, he was too busy getting all of the dissenters out of prison to appoint them to important positions. <laughs> um, he, he released, I think, was it 2,000 or something like that uh, from prison in, in his first few months, uh, many of whom have been languishing in prison for, for about 15 years. Um, uh, I mean, yes, he was a Catholic and, and, and he liked Catholics and he wanted to be king and so he appointed people who, who would work with him. Um, he had to appoint his cabinet from Parliament. Um, they were mostly opposed to him, so picking co-religionists would be the best way of getting people who'd be most likely to work with him. Um, he appointed three Anglicans to the Ecclesiastical Commission and one dissenter, uh, just one Catholic to that. Um, no, he, he made use of lots of Protestants, uh, but he, yeah, he was too busy not killing them or not uh, not putting them in prison anymore. Um, and the Covenanters were terrorists. The, the, um, the Protestants in Scotland quite liked him. All, all the Protestant bishops wrote back when he left as um, High Commissioner of Scotland, uh, and they, they were praising him to the skies. Um, he, he acted as, you know, as well as he could in, in, in Scotland, but the only trouble was um, that the, the Scots Covenanters were people who went around causing a great deal of nuisance. Returning then to education and perhaps taking a bit of an example from Dr. Modell's discussion of overcoming hardship and using that to transform into something better, I would ask now in the age of technologies, what pursuits do you perhaps see uh, avenues by which we can regain that libertas scholastica? What technologies, what inventions, where do you see the new, perhaps virtual, sometimes even smaller, the pub house where we can form that nucleus? Obviously, this is a great example, but what else could you suggest? I think on the whole, education is uh, overestimated. <laughs> it has become part of a substitute religion. Uh, the ancient Greeks, they uh, differentiated between a, a techne and an episteme. And the one is a practical art, and the other one is reflection, it's theory. And the thing is that most practical arts you can't really teach explicitly from a podium to people. The best way to learn them is just do them and practice. Uh, for most practical arts, it's about 10,000 hours of practice. And then you master them. Uh, a lot of university subjects today were never meant to be university subjects. It really doesn't make sense to study entrepreneurship. Okay, Entrepreneurial theory is part of practical philosophy, maybe, and that's maybe part of theory and it's interdisciplinary approach in understanding the world and the people within them. And that clearly is part of a leisure activity, I'd say. It's not something that you can count on to make your living. Uh, societies have a need if they are wealthy for craftsmen in the liberal arts as well, in understanding the world, in conveying them, but much, much less on the huge supply of academics we have today. There's no way all those theoreticians would find employment 
uh, in a market society. And of course, that's the reason why they are against the market. That's the main reason. They unconsciously know that there won't be such a demand for that. So I'm, I don't think that, uh, of course, technology, it lowers uh, the price uh, of reaching people via your words. Uh, and that will put some good pressure and healthy pressure, pressure on universities. But people will realize that universities are not selling education. They are selling certificates. So a lot of entrepreneurs have tried to make uh, uh, digital education work, and they found out that it's really hard to make it a business. To make it a business, you usually you sell the certificates from the uh, elite universities, and then you fake some kind of digital education. But it's not the education that people pay for, it's the certificate they get. And that you have to distinguish and be aware of that. Uh, there are some problems with digital education because usually it lacks the commitment uh, and it's not entirely sure. Uh, there are some results from uh, ne neurological science that uh, make you worry about some of the claims of digital education. So I don't think that digital education can cover everything of the part of episteme, of really thinking and understand, thinking about the world and understanding it because there's a lot of argumentation. Yeah, it's arguing, uh, uh, it's trying to refine your arguments, uh, and it is very hard to do in a one-way direction, which you can easily scale up. You can't really scale up the seminar. People who are successful in their field and trying to master the field by learning from them, by copying them, imitating them, that's been the traditional way throughout the world, throughout the cultures, and I think it will remain the way uh, for the future as well. Uh, there are some practical, uh, technical things that can be made explicit in particular programming. Okay? So, and, but there are already very good offers to teach yourself coding via internet, digital platforms. Uh, it's difficult to make money from that, uh, but some entrepreneurs manage ways to do that. Uh, and I think we'll see more of that uh, for everything that can be made explicit. Uh, but that's just a tiny proportion of, of the practical arts. Um, yes, I will give t two answers uh, on the field that I'm more familiar with, which is mathematics. And um, I mentioned the Khan Academy. So they don't actually make money. They're more like run like a charity. And that, that I think, is a model that sort of works. Um, I find it, the videos are very, um, very explicit, very clear. You can watch them as many times as you want. And the best thing about this particular uh, website and organization is the, um, you get graded in every dimension and then y you can progress, you can chart your progress in a very structured way. So you don't sort of jump around from this video to that video, you just for go forward in the many subfields of mathematics at the right pace and in an ordered fashion. So, so I think that sort of works, but I, I mentioned uh, that it's not very profitable. Um, the, the other thing that I can mention is the fact that, you know, nowadays, if you don't believe in the electronic kind of way, and, you know, you mentioned some, some research that sort of casts some doubt there, um, you can really just buy a textbook and let your child go through the textbook, go through the homework, go through exams. You don't actually have to do the teaching. Self-teaching, if for certain textbooks, you know, is, is completely okay. You know, obviously you have to be a presence. You cannot just sort of go to the office and then, you know, come back eight hours later and expect the child has gone through the book. So the child has to sort of be next to you and you're working, you, you have a job, you're doing things. And then, you know, the child, doing their own things too and you know just structure the whole thing and the textbook if it's uh, well chosen uh, is is uh, is completely fine um, you know, so definitely in, in mathematics and the sciences that's that's a good model yeah just a li little addition I think it works really well for maths for coding for everything where there are laws that you just need to learn and practice you won't get educated I don't think anyone should be fooled in that you can in the European sense become an educated person by attending Khan Academy uh, or reading textbooks uh, and so on. That's, there's a whole different sense in the European sense to being educated and that's where most of the prestige of higher education comes from.
Okay, you cannot separate uh, uh, that uh, from from that ancient prestige, and it's some something very broad, something based on on arguing on logics and confronting things for which there are not set laws. Okay. Uh, I have a criticism of not only the five of you, but of Hans also. None of you gave us a trigger warning. <laughs> Where is the safe space? <laughs> uh, on a more serious note, Hans is looking at me askance. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, the University of Chicago president just came out with a very, very nice letter to incoming freshmen at the University of Chicago. And I think if anyone is not aware of that, they should be. He was saying, we don't believe in trigger warnings or safe spaces. We believe in uh, robust discussion as we have here at the PFS. So that would be a very important addition to the uh, education uh, system that, that we're open to all ideas, and, and we believe in thorough disagreement, uh, if need be. I mean, John Stuart Mill in On Liberty, one of his good things said that the way to get to the truth is you, one says this, one says that. You argue back and forth, and if we have trigger warnings and safe spaces, we're not going to have much education. <laughs>